Stephen Schwartzman has given 150 million pounds to Oxford University, the largest contribution in its 800-year history. The Blackstone Group head has emerged as a major philanthropist with donations to the New York Public Library, MIT and Yale. He's also close to President Donald Trump and a little bit of a scholar when it comes to China. Well, I'm very pleased to be welcoming on Bloomberg Surveillance, the Blackstone Group chief executive here in London. He is Stephen Schwartzman. Steve, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for coming in. Now, this is basically a, a faculty, a hub that brings the humanities faculties to tackle ethical questions on artificial intelligence. But who's it up to to figure out how we regulate this so that we don't displace too many workers? Right. Well, it's, it's, it's more than that. Uh, for, first of all, it's bringing together the humanities faculties where Oxford is uh, ranked number one in the world uh, and they've never been together. It's all been separate buildings and now it's going to be combined so they can get the advantage of cross-disciplinary uh, kinds of stuff. Uh, we're going to have a major performing arts center uh, and uh, th that'll enable certain themes in the humanities to get played out. Uh, and then uh, as I was learning about what Oxford was doing, I realized that their capabilities in humanities and philosophy in particular played right into uh, my concerns uh, about what happens when you introduce AI uh, globally uh, and what happens to the displacement of workers, uh, all kinds of other, you know, uh, unexpected consequences. And, and, and so using the Oxford uh, core of Western civilization mm -hmm. to figure out what's human as you make decisions of what should be actually implemented is, is I think, the second piece uh, beyond just the technical. But Steve Schwartzman, the, the politicians no longer listen to the academics. They no longer listen to, to the global elite. Why would they listen to anyone coming from Oxford? Well, I think the reason is that in this intersection between technology, about which governments know uh, pretty much next to nothing, uh, and, and, and the real world, where workers uh, can be adversely affected, which changes how society works and, and, and can change political things, that it's important to have somebody who's an arbitrator, if you will, mm -hmm. who can make recommendations to, to government, uh, who, who have knowledge uh, and, and broach uh, the, the two areas, uh, that they're naturals to do this. Just leaving this to government, as we can see in the United States, uh, with just the simple issue of privacy, is, is quite difficult. What are the questions that you would ask about AI right now? There's so many concerns about how certain countries, including China, for example, process the data and use the data to profile possibly a lot of their citizens. Well, that's China's right. Uh, and the West has a different set of core values. So, so one of the things, Francine, is we're going to be running into this issue of what really are our core values that we care about uh, and other, other societies uh, with different cultures, they'll do things differently. And we, we can't make them do what our values are and, and vice versa. Steve Schwartzman, uh, the library at Oxford, going back to 1602, has a very modern article out on its website analyzing the tweets of the President of the United States. You are one of the great uh, advisors. You talk often to the President as well. You are the sole remaining free trader in his ear. Cohn is out the door. Kudlow's done a great job, but Larry's been very ill. We hope he gets better and gets his strength back. You're it on free trade. How do you nudge the first mercantilist back towards Schwartzman free trade? Well, I, I think what's underlying that, Tom, uh, and by the way, I, I have no responsibility for any tweet uh, uh, by him or anyone else, uh, that uh, what, 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 what I think the president's looking for, and I'm not his spokesman on this, but what he's looking for is basically equivalence in terms of open markets and tariffs and, and, and trade. Uh, and, you know, there, there's not a real desire to entrench uh, the United States in some way. It should be uh, sort of fair competition. And, and all of these issues um, 
uh, that are that are being used as as tactics, uh, uh, if you will, uh, are, are done to bring people to the table uh, so that you can get to equal. Uh, and, you know, so the best products win, the best price wins. If the U.S. loses, so they lose. If the U.S. wins, that's good. Uh, but but I don't think there's another uh, agenda. Right. Uh, and, right. And, and so it's really just an evolution as developed market countries like China get to parity. Uh, will they? Okay. What time frame? Okay. Steve, Steve, I don't mean to interrupt, but this is really, really important. People don't know that you've also given not only to MIT, not only to others in America and now at Oxford, but you've donated substantial money towards the education of China with the Schwarzman College. You are a great listener of the leadership of China. What are you hearing from the leadership of China as they go to G20, as they deal with this president? What's the nuance you can give us right now? Well, this is a sort of a time where things are somewhat impenetrable. Um, the negotiations that had been going on uh, basically were uh, stopped uh, by, by the Chinese side. And, and, and each of the two countries, as, as you've seen, uh, and we've all seen, it seems to be uh, sort of bifurcated, going to their corners uh, and, and scaring the business community and uh, creating an adversarial uh, situation. And th that will continue uh, unless it's changed uh, by, uh, by the two presidents. So, so the meeting, uh, in Japan is is quite important uh, because they they have the ability to reset uh, expectations, which now uh, were quite close, uh, but for some reason just just sort of like disappeared. Uh, and if if that can be put together in terms of a framework, th then the trade negotiators can go back to work and perhaps get something done. For our global audience, listeners and viewers, we're with Stephen Schwartzman, head of Blackstone, who, who has given £150 million to the University of Oxford. If this is a Schwartzman Center for Humanity at Oxford, what would be top of your curriculum? Job displacement or, or, or ethics? Well, there are a variety of things. You know, they have seven different areas, uh, ranging from English and history to, to uh, theology and the core uh, curriculum. Uh, of, of the liberal arts, uh, if you will. And that'll be taught. But in addition, uh, we're going to set up uh, a new, uh, or Oxford's going to set up uh, a new uh, AI ethics uh, uh, activity, which won't just use the humanities, which have a, are an unusual asset of Oxford, but will use the other major uh, parts of the university. And Oxford typically is ranked in the top five in the world. Uh, one of the great uh, universities. And, and if you can bring all that to bear, uh, we'll have better outcomes. Do you worry about Brexit? You're, you're giving to a university exactly at a moment where we don't know if we can still attract talent to this country, whether more students will need visas. Well, the UK has been around for a long time. It depends how you measure, at least 1,200 years. Uh, and uh, things in the short term are not nearly as important as what we're trying to do uh, in the long term. And, and you know, Brexit will take its way. Uh, that's up to the, the British uh, and the parliament, the government. It's so well covered. Uh, nobody knows quite how it's going to turn out. And from my perspective on this gift, uh, what's important is we set up the right structure for 100 years, 200 years. If you look at the program that Tom was mentioning about, which was the Schwarzman Scholars Program at Tsinghua in China, has a trade war affected that? Well, it's amazing. Uh, you know, that program is sort of like the roads, except we take extraordinary people, uh, and instead of going to Oxford, which is sort of an accident, um, uh, going to China uh, and teaching them about how China works. It started uh, with the endorsement of President Xi and President Obama. Uh, and thus far, uh, we have not been affected. Uh, education more generally in China has felt somewhat of a chill uh, as, as, as there are a variety of issues, whether they're trade or other types of things affecting China, uh, leading it to a, a more of a nationalistic 
uh, approach. Uh, I think uh, Schwarzman Scholars is viewed as a window uh, on, on, on the Western world and for the West uh, into China. Uh, and so I think it serves everyone's purpose uh, to have Schwarzman Scholars um, thriving. Steve Schwarzman, I got to play off uh, a Wall Street Journal article today on scale and on the size and success of your Blackstone. Folks, to just give you perspective, in the last 10 years, Steve Schwarzman has outdone Goldman Sachs by 1,742 basis points. It's stunning, 20-something percent per year versus a paltry 5 percent or whatever at Goldman uh, Sachs per year. It's a stunning, stunning outperformance. Are you getting too big? I mean, just simply, Steve, can you move the needle on deal transactions anymore with the scale that you've invented at Blackstone? Uh, the answer is sure, uh, or else we wouldn't do it. Uh, we're, we're not in the business of, of trying to hurt customers and our investors. We're trying to help them. And the way you get bigger in our world isn't by going into one strategy and keep making it so big that the thing can't perform anymore. Uh, the, the, the sort of approach that we've always had is to add new ideas which, which manifest themselves as different funds, and they should be right-sized, and we should catch an opportunity where there's really great returns, and we keep our more mature funds. They grow. The world grows. Uh, uh, but, but their job isn't to grow at an accelerated rate. Uh, we also don't need many deals in each of our funds. So in a normal year, typically, maybe we would do 10 transactions for a fund, um, just a right. little range on either side. But, for example, in private equity, we have 250 people all around the world. If we can't do 10 really interesting investments, we're really doing right. something wrong. Right. Steve, Buried in the Bod at Oxford is a book. It's an ancient, ancient Gothic book from about 1640. What the hell do we do with Deutsche Bank? It's a great book. Let me ask you the question right now. <laughs> what would you do with Deutsche Bank? Well, this one is, is sort of a tough one. I, I don't know that they were writing about it in 1640, but they, they certainly are in 2019. Uh, and. The, the issue there, and, uh, you know, I don't work at Deutsche Bank, but, but you know, they, they, they basically have an investment bank and, and, and a consumer uh, uh, banking system. And the consumer bank isn't real profitable, and the investment bank uh, is, is, is suffering, really, from this en endless questioning. It's very hard to keep uh, any service organization uh, together. Uh, as, as, as you asked that kind of question, Tom, which really reflects uh, questions that everybody are in, uh, asking, including, you know, sort of uh, uh, their shareholders and board people. But, it, but if you were in charge, either a Deutsche Bank or regulators, would you consolidate banks in Europe? It, it feels like it's overbanked. I, I, I would not be in charge. Okay. Uh, and there are certain things we can pick in life, and that's one pick that I wouldn't choose. Okay. W would you be Fed chair? And, and do you believe that the world needs more stimulus? Is that right, that, that we're in a dovish stance? Or the world economy is, is kind of at a turning point. Yes. Are we, are we putting more trouble ahead by stimulating too much? Well, you know, in sort of three economic blocks. You've got China that's got its own issues, but still growing somewhere in the 5 to 6 percent area, despite uh, at least the current levels uh, of tariffs. You've got the U.S. that's slowed down a little bit. Um, you know, my own guess, nobody ever knows these things. They all keep being revised anyhow, even if they're reported, uh, is, is somewhere around 2 to 2.5. And, uh, and, and, and given the fact that Europe is running negative interest rates uh, and slower growth, the issue is really Europe. And, and the currencies start adjusting, you know, to these negative rates and, and U.S. slower growth. So it's, it's sort of logical, you know, that U.S. interest rates might come down a little bit. Uh, you know, we're slowing, but we're, we're yeah. not anywhere yeah. near approaching recession. Steve, I want to talk about 2020. We opened with the president, the montage in Orlando. Explain to disaffected Republicans why they need to step up and support President Trump for a second term. They can't term. They can't stand him. How do, how do you and the president get disaffected GOP over to support him once more? 
Well, I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a political election expert, Tom. I'm, I'm like everybody else. I watch this stuff. Uh, and, and I think uh, what will drive the Republicans to come out is which Democrat uh, uh, is the nominee. Uh, to the extent that, that the Democratic nominees, you know, prove threatening uh, to, to middle class or other people. Basically, the last election, I guess, was, was won pretty much by suburban uh, women. Uh, who, who went to the Republicans uh, in 2016. Uh, at the moment, that's not the case. Uh, it depends um, the issues that they're facing. Uh, and if, if they think that the Democrats have gone too far left, yeah. uh, uh, and that, you know, they'll, they'll swing back uh, uh, and, and we what? won't know who that person is. Uh, we don't know what they really believe until later. But what does the, the U.S. economy need right now? What kind of polit policies does the U.S. economy need from, from the U.S. president? Well, I think um, the, the only change in policies, we're already running really big deficits, so, so there's not a lot of room uh, on the fiscal side. Uh, you could move interest rates down a little bit, but they're actually pretty low. Uh, and whether they get a little lower is great symbolically. Uh, it's, it's not going to change what business uh, decides to do. It just gives you some uh, confidence. So I think the, the type of thing that would, would work is if some of the trade issues were, were resolved so people could, could have the confidence to know what's going to happen. That's what slows an economy. 